becomes painful for three types of people. Death becomes painful for them. Three types of people death becomes painful for. Think and look in yourself. Do I have these three characteristics? Shall I tell you what those characteristics is? The first characteristic is a person who supports an oppressor. Your death becomes difficult for you if you support an oppressor. What does it mean by supporting an oppressor? Does it mean by supporting Yazid, Saddam, Namrud, Fir'aun? Is that just oppression? No. Shall I tell you what oppression means? Let me give you an example. Then think within yourself if you have these qualities. Your sister has a fight with her brother. Your, uh, her, your sister has a fight with her husband, your brother-in-law, right? What happens? Straight away, without even asking, you take the side of your sister. What have you done? Vulm. You've become an oppressor. What happens? On the moment of your death, you could die a kafir because of that. Go into the ruayat and see. You've done oppression. What does it say in the tradition? A qadi, a person who is a justice, the justice, you could say, the qadi, what is he? He is a person who is between heaven and hell. One wrong decision means that you can go into hell or go towards heaven. You become that qadi then. The minute somebody has a fight, the minute you have an issue in the mosque, straight away you go back to the party that you support. Your responsibility is, regardless of whether it's your own son, your responsibility is that you hear two sides of the story. Straight away we make up our mind because there are children. How many times have you seen mothers point blank support their children, knowing full well that their children are wrong, they still support them. You know, recently a person came to me and they said to me, child, they said our mother, and this, this was the flip side of it, says everyone's children or everyone's mother support their children. Our mother doesn't always support us. Whenever we do something, she asks us questions, she interrogates us, she does the just thing. But if you look at other people's mothers, they support them point blank. I said, you should be thankful and grateful that your mother has justice because she's paving a way towards heaven. Regardless of whether it, if it's my son or your son, the fact of the matter is that when they're wrong, they're wrong. Do not be one of the oppressors. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to mention this, because in every mosque, not just in Shia mosque, Sunni mosque, you find in every institution, and again, no one's told me about the issues you may have here, so I'm not going to raise any issues here. As far as I'm concerned, there are no issues in Bathurst. So I'm going to go next door to the other centers, which are next door, and I'll mention them. When two parties are fighting, when presidents are fighting, when groups are fighting, what is our responsibility in that? Our responsibility is that we need to be just. Otherwise, our death can be very painful. We can die the death of a kafir. Be very careful what you do. Be very careful the decision you make. Do not oppress a person. No one think that when an oppressed person raises hands, it becomes mustajab. When an oppressed person curses you, where are you going to turn to? If you've oppressed anyone, and one of the people that you find that you oppress are your family members. How many people are oppressing their spouse without knowing it? The fact that you go into your house and sometimes you're aggressive with your wife. Why are you aggressive? Because I've had a bad day's work today. I got fired or whatever happened. The minute you come into the house, you start taking it out on your wife and your children. What have you done? You've oppressed them. What is your down? If you were to die, it's possible you die the death of a kafir. Do you want to risk all of that? Do you want to become an oppressor? What happens when you become an oppressor? The grace of Allah is taken away. The threshold for problems when they come in your life to tackle them are taken away. You know, you find problem upon problem comes for that person who's an oppressor. Do not do dhulm then. In the same way that you find wives as well. Straight away they start abusing. Without knowing it, they start abusing and raising their voices and saying things to their husbands. Not realizing that they're doing it. Sometimes the people that we care about the most we take for granted. Make sure that you don't oppress your wife, your children or your husbands. You see, it happens in our daily life. Oppression is something which is open to us. It happens in our mosques, it happens in our madrasas, it happens amongst brothers and sisters. But be a person like Amir al-Mu'mineen that's just. Develop that justice in yourself. That even when it comes to his own Shia, you know what he says? He says that I'll treat you with justice. I'll treat you with justice. Regardless of whoever you are, whatever you are. Second thing, one, oppression. Second thing, false statements. How many times do we swear or we say a qasam or we say something and we don't live up to it. False testimony in a court of law. Even if it's going against you, don't ever lie. They say lying is the key to sins. The minute you begin to lie, 
The Imam alayhi salam is saying there's a tradition that says, it says, my Shias may sin, but one thing they don't do is they don't lie. My Shias may do many things. They may be very sinful, all sorts of sins. But the one thing that they don't do is they don't lie. They're truthful. Second thing, painful death. If you have that vice that you lie, you're not a Shia. Remove that within yourself. But then the Imam says another thing, and this gives us hope. He says, maybe my Shias will sin. They're not infallible. They will sin. But my Shias are those people who repent straight away. Sometimes, you know, we say to ourselves that we feel embarrassed standing in front of Allah. You say that, right? I feel embarrassed. How can I face my Lord? I've just sinned. And I was sinning yesterday as well, and I'm sinning today. But Allah says, he says, even if you sin, don't turn away from me, my servant. Come back to me. Even if you've sinned, make sure that you repent straight away. Regardless, yes, you feel embarrassed. It's good to feel embarrassed. Is the day when you don't feel embarrassed is the day that your heart is now being closed. Second thing. Third thing. See, Tawbah is a very powerful thing. It takes you back to Allah. What are you saying? You're saying, I repent and I come back to the Creator again. So make sure that you make a covenant with yourself. Deep down, whenever I sin, I'll repent straight away. The question is asked. A lot of times the youth ask the question, right? How about if we're persistently sinning? Does Allah still forgive us? The answer to that is Allah will continue to forgive you if you make the intention that I'll never do it again. Be remorseful, cry, be embarrassed, and then say to Allah, I will never do it again. If you have that 100% conviction that you will never do it again, even if you were to sin again, but that conviction was there, the certainty was there, Allah will forgive you. And if again you repent with 100% sincerity, and again you sin, Allah will still forgive you. Even if it's a thousand times, Allah will forgive you a thousand times. The difference is the state of mind. You need to make sure that I'm trying my best that I will never sin again and see what Allah does. He will help you, then he will push you. A question was asked. They were asked, how can we know that Allah is accepting us and our sins are being forgiven? In the traditions it says, if a person is enjoying praying, if they have that lezza while they pray, if they have the pleasure while they pray, the more the pleasure increases, the more you realize that Allah is accepting your prayers and Allah has forgiven you from your sins. But the more you find that you are distracted and pushed away from your prayer, you find that the more you are moving away from God. This is why no one thing. Someone came to the great master of Irfan, Sayyid Ali Qadhi, that mountain of Tawheed, the teacher of Allah Matabatabai, the teacher of Ayatollah Bahjad, the teacher of Hassan Allahi, the teacher of Ayatollah Khoi, comes up to him and he asks him, he says, tell me Sayyid, tell me one thing, if I want to reach Allah, if I want to gain Allah, if I want Ma'rif of Allah, if I want to be an Arif, if I want to be like you, tell me one thing that I can do, just the one thing, I have time for nothing else, Give me that one thing that I can do that I can reach Allah. Said Ali Qadi replies and says, If a person for 40 days prays awwal waqt on time, and if he doesn't see spiritual gain or the fact that they're moving maqamat, he can come and he can spit on my grave if he has to do that. It's the power of a person who's praying. There's a handwritten note from Sayyid Ali Qadi that I have a photocopy of. It says this, if a person takes care of his prayers, everything else takes care of itself. If you are having financial difficulty, make sure that you're praying on time, that you make the axes of your life, your prayers, and you see all of those things, all of the problems, trials, and tribulation are alleviated from your life. This is why one thing we say, and that thing is this, that regardless of who you are, however big a sinner you are, whatever you do, don't give up on your prayers. You know, a lot of times people will say to you, uh, look at you, you sin and you still pray. What kind of a believer are you? Don't be disheartened by them. Whoever you are, however you are, whatever sin you are doing, continue to pray to Allah. The minute your prayers become qada and the minute you forget your prayers, know the mercy of Allah has been lifted up from you. When that mercy is lifted, where are you going to go then? To what doorstep are you going to go when problems befall you? You have moved away from the mercy of Allah. So make sure whatever happens, however sinful you are, make sure you pray. For God's sake, don't leave one thing and that's the threshold of prayer. As long as you have that prayer, what did Amir al-Mu'mineen say? Battle of Safin is going on. Swords are flashing in the night sky. Amir al-Mu'mineen turns out, he says, it's the time for prayer. A person comes to him and says to him, Amir al-Mu'mineen, we're in the middle of a war. He says, what are we fighting for? We're fighting for this prayer. He says, you continue, I'm going to pray. Allahu Akbar, he starts on the battlefield praying. 
That is Amir al-Mu'mineen. Go back and see Sayyidul Shuhada. Dhuhr time comes. What does he say? He says it's the time for prayer. But Mola, it's a battlefield. He says that we are doing everything for this prayer. The purpose is this prayer. Later on, a person comes to Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. He says to him, after Karbala comes to him, he says, Mawla, tell us, who won? Yazid or your father? Now imagine asking that question. 18 of your family members have been killed. You've gone from Kufa to Sham. Your entire family has been violated. And a person comes to you and asks you who won. Imagine what Imam Zain al-Abidin must have been feeling. You know what he replies? Calmly, he says, he says, why don't you go and pray two units of prayers in Masjid al-Nabawi and then come back to me and I'll answer your question. The person goes and he comes back. He says, now Mala, tell me who won. Imam says, do I need to tell you who won? The fact that prayer is still established means that my father won and Yazid lost. The entire battle is for those two units of prayers. Those two units of prayer symbolizes Tawheed. When a person comes to the Imam and he says, you have given us the Kabair, the major sins. Where is not praying? You know, you said the first thing is shirk. Where is it that not praying? The second thing, for example, is losing faith in God. And then after that, lying and alcohol and all of these things, then in the kabai of the major sins, the imam replies, he says, not praying is shirk, comes into the first category. Why? Because you're saying to yourself that Allah, I'm not going to follow you. I'm going to follow my nafs. Therefore, your nafs has become your God. This is why Akhra Zaman, there's a tradition that says people will follow the dinar and dirham, it will become their Lord. What does that mean? That means your entire life will be spent in buying that Ferrari and buying that big house and having that wife and having those children that you always wanted. You forget the idea that the purpose is not the wealth. The purpose is have wealth, but have it for the sake of Allah. Second thing. Now let's go to the third thing. From false testimony, if we move forward, third thing, usurpation of the right of orphans. How many people do that in a day, in a lifetime, in a month, in a year? Let me give you an example. Those ulama of Najaf, right? When a father would pass away and he had small children, they wouldn't even eat at that person's house. You know why? Not even a glass of water. Because they would say, just in case, that's the inheritance of that child. That's how strict they were. They were strict to such an extent that they didn't even take the wealth of an orphan just in case. You see, if these three characteristics are there of a person, you find they die the death, very difficult death.